Welcome everyone to another review of Archie Sonic the Hedgehog, and today we're tackling issue 9. Based on the cover, an homage of the Flash of Two Worlds cover, Sonic and his friends are about to encounter the Hedgehog's first robotic duplicate, Pseudo Sonic. If you want to be technical, the first ever Sonic robotic duplicate, franchise-wise, was Silver Sonic from Sonic the Hedgehog 2, the 8-bit edition. Yeah, in case you don't know, Sonic 2 8-bit was released before Sonic 2 16-bit, in North America's case, days before. And the Silver Sonic in the 16-bit version is really called Mecha Sonic, but I'm getting off topic. I have more to say about Pseudo Sonic, but for now, let's dive into the issue. Robotnik monologues on how he knows enough about Sonic to create, in his words, the ultimate evil robot, Pseudo Sonic. Despite some flaws, Pseudo Sonic can match Sonic's speed, and once Robotnik irons out those bugs, he'll send the robot duplicate into the Great Forest. Meanwhile, the real Sonic is off to pick some flowers for Sally, Antoine standing guard at the secret knothole entrance. Or at least he's trying to. As Sonic's picking flowers, this creature, Betty Butterfly, flies over to tell Sonic he's in a poison sumac bush. Sonic panics because he's allergic to the stuff. He's been exposed long enough that he becomes a bloated mess covered in rashes. With Sonic out of commission, this leaves Pseudo Sonic free to ambush Antoine at the secret entrance. The two go down the chute into the base, and Pseudo Sonic prepares to transmit Knothole's location while the Freedom Fighters watch in shock. Before Robotnik receives the coordinates, the transmission dies. Tails drags his tails around, creating a field of static electricity powerful enough that Pseudo Sonic falls to pieces. Well, that takes care of that. So, how's Sonic doing? He's not bloated anymore, but he still has rashes and is scratching like crazy. Also, Poison Sumac allergies weaken him enough that he cannot move. This is bad since Robotnik was smart enough to try and pinpoint Pseudo-Sonic's last known position. He instead comes across the defenseless Sonic and plans to take advantage of this. After toying him with a flamethrower, Robotnik decides a mace to the face should finish the job. He won't get the chance as someone shoots his Eggmobile to pieces. That someone is Bunny. This rescue didn't completely come out of nowhere. Earlier, when the Freedom Fighters were analyzing Pseudo-Sonic, Betty Butterfly showed up to tell everyone about Sonic's poison sumac-induced state. Bunny takes care of Robotnik by tossing him all the way back to Robotropolis. She then provides Sonic with ointment to clear up those rashes. They return to Knothole just as Rotor's taking out the Pseudo-Sonic trash. And the story ends with the robot hoping enough people would write in so he would get a sequel. Don't worry, Pseudo Sonic. One day it will happen. Time to breeze through some gag stories. First is Robotnik building a new bot to unleash on his enemies. But one look at it, and he immediately orders it destroyed. The reason? It's a dentist bot. Given all the oil-filled chocolate Robotnik eats, his teeth are likely full of cavities. The next gag story has artist Dave Manick demonstrating how to draw Sonic. Though as soon as penciling and inking are complete, he speeds off before he can be colored. Alright, time for our second big story. Sonic is racing back to Knothole with flowers for Sally's birthday. Only his speed causes all the petals to fly off. Look at it this way, Sonic. At least they're not poison sumac. As he tries to figure out what to get Sally, a bird falls on top of him. This is a Mobian needle bird, half bird, half porcupine, and according to Sonic, Robotnik should have roboticized all of them. Guess he missed one. Its wing is injured, so Sonic decides to take care of it by feeding it needle berries and naming it Thorny. He then gets the idea to give it to Sally since she loves animals. Her response at the party suggests otherwise. Yeah, she's not happy Sonic brought Thorny to Knothole. With good reason. In the past, Robotnik tried using woodland creatures to either find their base, or to destroy them. And she's afraid it might happen again. The only thing Thorny's after is Sally's cake, which has needleberries in it. Sally orders Sonic to get rid of the bird immediately. Rotor can make another cake after picking some more needleberries, though Sally will take care of that herself as a way to blow off some steam. 
Outside, Sonic places Thorny on top of a tree so its wing can heal. Afterwards, he hears a nearby scream. One of Robotnik's forest traps, a tree monster bot in this case, has captured Sally. Sonic tries to find Sally and the tree, but before what I assume is another tree trap grabs him, Thorny comes to the rescue. They find Sally's tree, and Thorny lets go of Sonic so he can spin Nash the arm off. Robotnik arrives with a freeze gun, and with Sonic still trying to get Sally out of the tree's fist, it looks like the Doc may finally win this one. Until Thorny drops an egg on him. Good thing it's only an egg. Thorny sprays Robotnik with its porcupine quills, and the villain makes a run for it. Sally thanks Sonic and Thorny, and they decide to make Thorny an honorary freedom fighter. Our final gag story is a big, muscular Sonic posing for a picture? Oh, thank goodness. It's just a photo stand-in. We don't have to worry about giant, muscly versions of our heroes. This time. I mentioned this in my previous review, but the Goofy Tone tends to hold back any potential in a story. The Pseudo-Sonic story is such an example. We have Robotnik creating an evil robotic duplicate of our hero that can match him in speed, but we never see the two interact. All Pseudo-Sonic does is locate Knothole, which is awesome for him. That awesomeness is ruined when Tails destroys them via static electricity. Admittedly an awesome moment for the two-tailed fox. Sonic himself is disabled most of the story thanks to Poison Sumac, leaving Bunny to save him from Robotnik. It is nice to see Bunny back in action, but I can see why writers left her out of a number of early stories after her introduction. If they wanted, they could have her easily take care of Robotnik no problem. I was originally underwhelmed by this story, until I did a little research. It turns out, this story is a loose adaptation of an episode of The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, also titled Pseudo-Sonic. The plot featured Robotnik building the titular robot to frame Sonic for various crimes. Unlike the comic version, which had an independent AI, this Pseudo-Sonic needed a living person inside to operate it. A nod to how, in the games, Robotnik's badniks need living animals for them to operate. A rat named Lawrence was forced to pilot the machine because the doctor held the guy's parents hostage. Sonic and Pseudo-Sonic Lawrence do come into conflict, and they wind up in Poison Flower Valley, where they started itching and swelling up. At least they went to the hospital in this case. Tails took it upon himself to rescue Lawrence's parents, even taking control of Pseudo-Sonic to do so. Sonic later joined him, the two saved the parents, and Pseudo-Sonic was destroyed. So you can see what elements Gallagher took from that episode, and applied it to the chimera that is this comic series. Speaking of freaky things, the issue brought us Betty Butterfly. While she serves as a plot convenience character, and only appears in this issue, thank goodness, this introduces a new concept to the series, non-anthropomorphic sapient animals. And she won't be the last one to appear. Final score is a 6. Again, it's a shame Sonic had to be taken out of the action the way he did, but it did allow other members of his team to save the day. I do appreciate the small bits of continuity, such as Bunny's hair salon, and Rotor slapping his real name over his boomer nickname at his lab, to remind readers that, yeah, his name has changed. If you're disappointed as I was that Sonic and Pseudo-Sonic never came into conflict in this issue, I have some good news for you. There will be a future story down the line that will rectify this. 161 issues from now. The second story is your standard someone brings something home, only for someone else to tell them to get rid of it because it might be dangerous, only it turns out the something is on the level. Sally's anger is justified compared to her behavior in Issue 7. The group has been fooled by supposedly harmless woodland creatures in the past, and Thorny ate her birthday cake. She did come around on Thorny after it helped Sonic save her from Robotnik's forest trap. The traps themselves are an ingenious idea from the Doctor, using the terrain against our heroes. It's too bad after this issue, we never see them again. I say them because I believe there's more than one of these traps. The reason? Sally was held by Forest Trap's right hand, and while Sonic was trying to find her, what appears to be another trap was about to grab him with its right hand, and Sally was not in the immediate vicinity. 
of course, there's also a chance I'm wrong and there's only one forest trap. Dave Manick's art doesn't make it clear, or it could be an artist error. We also don't see Thorny again after this story, which is sad. Unlike Betty Butterfly, this is an actual animal who might be the last of its kind thanks to Robotnik. It would have been nice to have a team pet that could pop in every now and then, even if it's just chilling out in the background. Having Sonic taking care of Thorny emphasizes one of his traits seen throughout the franchise, taking care of and rescuing small animals. Why else would he smash bad eggs and free animals from capsules? For the kicks? I can't believe this! I was supposed to beat you this time! Ah, I'm sorry. I didn't get that memo. I beat you every time! No, seriously. We beat this guy every time. It's like it's our job or something. Okay, partially for the kicks. But at least he's being heroic about it. I'm giving this story an 8. A little surprising, yes. But when it comes to it, I'm a bit of a sucker when it comes to these rescue stories. I should note that this is the first issue that features stories written by both Gallagher and Angelo. I talked in issue 5 about how their humor styles differ, and you can really see it here. Gallagher has the more wacky fourth wall breaking style, and Angelo's has some lightheartedness, with room for some other emotional beats. Although there was a brief fourth wall breaking moment in Angelo's story just to get some tree puns out of the way. Come back next time as our heroes go underground and encounter a bunch of nerbs. No, not nerds, nerbs. I'll see you in issue 10. This is the face of someone who's about to give Antoine a massive wedgie. And the poor guy doesn't even wear pants.